Psalm, one, Psalm 100 is a wonderful place to start if you're trying to memorize scripture and if you're like me, that doesn't always come real easy. That is a, uh, that is a labor. It's a labor of love, but it is, it is difficult for me. Uh, my memory is not everything that I wish that it was. And so uh, sometimes you have to start in some very familiar places. Now, the key to memorizing Scripture is reading Scripture and reading it over and over again. Read it aloud and work on line at a time and, and, and just get there word at a time if you have to. But Psalm 100, I, I love it. Let's read it together. The Bible says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people, and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him, and bless His name. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. Father, we love You. We thank You for Your precious Word. And now I pray that You would bless the reading and preaching of it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Obviously, this is a psalm of, of thanks and praise, but I believe it's also a, a psalm of instruction. There are instructions here. And you know, sometimes we'll say things uh, in Christianity and, and, I, and it almost becomes church talk. And, and we don't always realize what it means. And uh, we don't think about what it means to other people. But let's look here at the directions. Uh, there are just some, some verbs here, some action verbs. Uh, in verse number one, make a joyful noise. I like that. And then it says, in verse number two, serve. It says we're supposed to serve. And then it says to come. And so uh, we have, we're, in verse one, we're making something. In verse two, we're serving. We're coming. And then in, in verse number three, it says we're supposed to know something. So there's another verb. Uh, we're supposed to know something. And and then in uh, verse number four, we enter, and then it says be, we're supposed to be something, and then it says bless, and we're supposed to bless somebody. And so I want to look at those uh, seven verbs and look at those seven things that we're supposed to do right here in the middle of a, 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 a psalm of thanksgiving, a psalm of praise. This is a psalm also of directions, of, of some things that we're supposed to do. And so it's a psalm of instruction. Look for First, that make. We're supposed to make something. If you're a believer, you're a child of God, you've been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, hey, there's some things we ought to do. There's something we ought to make. First thing it says is make a joyful noise. Look at that. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I love that. Now, I'm not a good singer. I don't sing well. I understand that. It may not be a good sound to you. And more than likely, if you've been around me when I sing, it's not a good sound to you. Uh, even our two-year-old, as soon as I start singing, he's like, stop, stop, daddy, stop. And, and, and he tries to get me to stop. But I sing. I love to sing. I sing up and down these hallways all week long. I sing in the, in the truck. I, everywhere I go, I, I'm singing. And it may not sound good to you, but I promise you, it's a noise that it, it resounds from joy. It is the result of joy. Hey, the joy, to the joy of the Lord is my strength, but He's also my song. And I'm thankful for that. So hey, we're supposed to make a joyful noise. You know what I get nervous about? Cool guys. Hey, cool guys make me nervous because cool guys don't like to sing. I get nervous if you claim to be a child of God and you think you're too cool to sing. Now, I'm not fussing at anybody. I wasn't paying attention to who was and who wasn't singing this morning. But I, I know this. It makes me nervous if somebody won't sing. I just wonder. I wonder about them. I wonder if the joy, joy of the Lord is their strength. I wonder if they know the Lord. Hey, there's just too many good songs that, that you, you just think about. Uh, they, we were singing Isaiah 40, 31 just a little while ago and, and uh, thinking about the, the songs and and, and, you know, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Man, and I think about that. They that wait upon the Lord. Hey, I'm waiting on the Lord. And they renew their strength. And I think about mounting up one day. Whew, mounting up like an eagle and flying. Do you know how amazing that's going to be? Amen. Yeah. 
Can you imagine what it's going to be like to be with... The, I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about having a close relationship with the Lord. Hey, that's wonderful. But to be physically in a glorified body with the Lord in His very presence, friend. Ooh, we that ought to make you want to sing. That just takes me back to them old bus days of being a little kid riding on a church bus. So I'm a, I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Hey, the other day I saw somebody, they said atheists are starting to have mega churches. Atheist mega churches. And they said one of the rules is you're not allowed to make fun of people that, that uh, have faith. It's not about that. It's just about getting together and being positive. And they realize that the function of the church is healthy and good. But they just don't believe in God. And I was like, man. I thought, what do they sing? I've got a home in hell for me that outburns the sun. I've got a home. What can wash away my sin? Nothing. What can make me whole again? Nothing. How pitiful. Atheists having mega churches. A couple of idiotic uh, comedians out of, out of Britain thought that up. Brought it to America. Don't you appreciate that? Hey, we import more than just toys from China. We're importing some stupidity from around the world. Hey, friend, we just... Hey... But here's the deal. We can't change what anybody else does. We can't change what other folks do. But I just still wonder why there's people who claim to be saved and they can't make a joyful noise under the Lord. Amen. Make a joy. Hey, this is an instruction. Make a joy. It didn't say we notice that some people make. No, it says make. If you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you ought to make a joyful noise. Now, I know this is written in the Old Testament, but this is clearly talking. Hey, same God. Hey, same God. And we ought to still make a joyful noise unto the Lord. We ought to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I love that. And then, and then you get to verse number two, serve. Well, who do you serve? The Lord. So make a joyful noise to Him. Serve Him. We're supposed to serve the Lord, by the way, with gladness. We're not to serve the Lord out of repetition. Serve the Lord out of obligation. You want to know why people quit? Because they, they, they serve the Lord, but some people do it out of obligation. Some people do it out of peer pressure. Because they want to fit in at church. So they, they serve the Lord. Out of, I mean, listen, there's worse things to do in peer pressure. But we ought to serve the Lord with gladness. I'm excited about what God's done in my life. I'll, I'll just be real honest with you. I'm not trying to be ugly. Hey, maybe you're going through a rough time. And, and maybe things aren't so great for you right now. And we've all been there. But I'm just telling you, all in all, through the good times and through the bad times. Hey, through the mountains and through the valleys. Hey, through the easy times and through the brambles of life. I'm just telling you, friend. God's good. And I serve Him with gladness. I'm glad to serve the Lord. What a blessing it is. Hey, I'm still freaked out that God could even use me to do anything. And I'm no super spiritual hero. I'm not talking about being super Christian with the, with the spiritual cape on. I'm just saying to do anything. I, I'm, I'm shocked if God would let me rake leaves on the churchyard. I'm shocked that I could plunge a toilet in the, at the church house. I, wash a window. Pick up a piece of trash. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm just thank God that, that somebody's not having to pick me up as a piece of trash. Hey, I'm thankful that God has blessed my life in the way that He is. I'm glad that God took me. What David say out of the uh, out of the miry pit, man, uh, man, out of the miry clay, out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay. Woo! Set my feet upon the rock to stay. What a blessing. Hey, how do we serve him? With gladness. By the way, it wasn't a question. It was a directive. Serve the Lord with gladness. We ought to... And then, then right there in the same verse, it says, Come before his presence with singing. Again, singing hit, hit again. But come before his presence. Some people say, I just feel like I'm so far away from the Lord. Wasn't God that moved, honey. It wasn't God that moved. Hey, where'd you leave him? It's probably where you'll find him. You know, I spent, and, and my te I hate my testimony that I was uh, away from the Lord for so many years, but I still remember thinking, man, I've been away from the Lord for nine, ten years. I'm going to have to travel all the way back. But you know what I found out? As soon as I turned and started trying to head back toward the Lord, he was right there. Amen. He met me. You know where he met me? Where I was. 
where I was. But you know what's important as a believer? That you intentionally come before His presence. Does God see you? Yes, God sees you. Does God know everything that we do? Yes, God knows everything that we do. Does He, does he see every move? Does He hear every idle word? Yes, absolutely He does. But you know what? There's just something about the believer coming intentionally before the presence of the Lord. Amen. And the Bible says we ought to come before His presence with singing. You know, I don't know when to do that. I'll just tell you, sometimes it's just sitting all alone. Sometimes it might be driving down the road. It might be in the shower. I don't know where you come, but there's just some time that you just come before where you just say, Lord, I just want to thank you for being so good to me. And, and you know, and I'm, I'm not trying to make an over big deal about singing, but I'm telling you, there's something about singing. Have you ever just, just been driving down the road and just start thinking about man, what your life would be like if you weren't saved? What you'd be like without the fellowship of the Lord and God's people? And man, I just started saying, thank you, Lord. And all of a sudden those songs start coming. I'm like, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Man, I just get all excited just thinking about it. I was driving to a hunting trip one time. And I was listening to a song, and, and I, I forget the preacher, and I don't even know who the, who the lady was that was singing. And man, all of a sudden, she hit a line that was talking about, I, I don't know about this, and it may be poverty, it may be this. And she said, man, but I knew I was bought by the blood. I just, I pulled over like I had a flat tire, got out, and just had to shout for a second. Just thinking about being bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Realizing that I had grieved the Lord. Realizing that my sin put Jesus Christ on the, on the cross. And just thinking about being bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Realizing that Satan had a stranglehold. Not just on me, but on my family and on my future. Jesus Christ, His blood on the cross, purchased me. I'm a purchased possession. Bought me with His blood and pulled me out of that nonsense. Man, snatched me out of hell. Sometimes you just got to shout and sing. And we ought to intentionally come before His presence with singing. Come before His presence. And then look at verse number 3. Know. Hey, you better know something. Know that He is Lord. Now, I love that. Know that He is Lord. He, the Lord, He is God. See, sometimes people get mixed up about the Lord. And they'll think about Jesus. And, and see, all of a sudden they'll put Jesus. And the only th way they think about Jesus is in a manger. Hey, some people, the only way they think about Jesus is as a baby in the manger. Some people, the only way they think about Jesus is when they clutch and they can feel his body still on the cross. Hey, he ain't on the cross. And I don't need no jewelry with him on the cross. And I don't need a bunch of beads with him on the cross. He's not on the cross. He's alive. And I'm so glad he's not on the cross today. Hey, he died once for all. Once and for all. He died one time so that you and I could know the blessing of salvation. Know the Lord, He is God. Now look at the next part there, just in the continuing thought there, the Lord, He is God. It says, it is He that made us and not we ourselves. I love when you go over to John chapter number 1. Somebody's like, well, Jesus isn't God. I believe that He's God's Son, but He's not really God. And then, and then you, know, you hear them, boy, they're so smart, sounding, not really, ignorance. And you say, well, who do you think... Made, well, God the Father did all the creating there in, in Genesis chapter number 1. It's like, really? Why don't we just run over to John chapter number 1? It would be okay for you to spend a couple of minutes there in the New Testament. And all of a sudden it said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So whoever that Word is, is God. And then all of a sudden, you get into the verses, it talks about that He made everything, and didn't nothing got made but what He made it. What? Are you kidding me? Hey, He's God. When you think about Jesus, you can just label Him God. You can label Him God because He is God. Hey, in fact, He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He got crucified because He confessed that He was God. They killed Him because of who He was. 
we have to know that it was He that made us. We didn't make ourselves. And then here's something that's important for us. The next part of the verse. We are His people. We're His people. You know, I can't control what other people's people do. But I try to have a pretty heavy influence on what my people do. My family... We, we, you know, you, you look at some, some kids and they're allowed to do everything in the world. That's the problem. They're doing it in the world. I want our kids to try to do things in the Lord. Now listen, one or all four of our boys may grow up to be worldly. But it's good. they're going to have to climb over mom and daddy. They're going to have to crawl over our prayers. They're going to have to crawl over our hopes and wishes. They're going to have to crawl over our church family's prayers and wishes. They're going to have to crawl over, hey, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that have been poured into them if they're going to go off into the world. We, we do our best not to ever provoke them under wrath. We try to have a peaceful home. And we try to have a godly home. And we love our children. And we try to surround them with godly people. Our, our kids have a great support group within just a, just a support structure within our church family and our family. Having Nana and Poppy living right across the, the pasture from us. And, and have, having aunts and uncles right up the road from us. And having our church family so close and knit together in love. Under the purpose of trying to be a, a, a church family. Family. Not a church group. Not trying to be the mall. We're not trying to be this and that. Listen, we're trying to be a church family. We're trying to be what God desires us to be. Hey, everybody knit together in love for the purpose of trying to reach people for, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, seeing them baptized and discipling them and, and so they could be an effective part of the family of God. Hey, there's a purpose in all of us. And we need to realize that we're His people. We're His people. And as His people, I, I think that we have a responsibility. As saved people, we are His purchased possession. As His people, we are His children. The day you got saved, you may not have realized it. You may not have seen a document written. You may not have heard a judge's gavel. But you were adopted into the family of God. And as part of the family of God, our Heavenly Father has some heavenly expectations. And we, have, we ought to live up to those expectations. And we ought to realize we're His people. And not only His people, but the sheep of His pasture. The sheep of his pasture. That's what the verse says right there. Look at it again. It says, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Now listen, that, that can, you could take that as an insult and it kind of is. Sheep are stupid. And the more people that you meet, you'll realize how accurate that statement is. I didn't realize it. I teach college and, and uh, the kids, the students take notes. And I didn't realize it. And the other day I was grading their notebooks and a bunch of them at the top. Uh, and, and that's how, you know, I, I was looking through their notebooks, seeing if they had all the lectures in there properly. And as I was looking at the top, they had quotes. And I started looking. I was going, those are my quotes. And I thought, I didn't remember saying that. She must have misquoted me. He must have misquoted me. He must have misquoted me. And I started realizing they all have the same quote. I must have said it. <laughs> so I look back, probably the second or third class we had, I just told them, I said, listen, there's a lot more stupidity in this world than you're bargaining for. And I thought, I got done, I was like, I can't believe I said that. But man, that's accurate. I promise you. You live in this wicked old world, there's a lot more stupidity going on in this world than you're probably thinking there is. And, uh, and so you got to be careful what you say if somebody's quoting you and typing it into their laptop. <laughs> but we are the sheep of his pasture. You know what that means? That, a shepherd decides where the sheep are going to eat. The shepherd decides where the sheep are going to get watered. The shepherd decides the protection level of the sheep. He decides where they go. He decides their path. He leads and the sheep have to follow if they're going to be protected. Listen, I know a lot of sheep right now that have been getting tore up by some wolves and by some lions and by some bears. There's a lot of hurt sheep right now. There's a hurt sheep over in Fort Worth at the Green Bay facility that's wanting me to come and visit. Yesterday, we found a sheep over at a drug rehab in, in, in Dallas that we needed to go and visit. I know some sheep that are just hiding out because they're hanging out with the wolves. They don't realize it's almost supper time and they're on the menu. Hey, you better realize who you belong to, Jack. We're his sheep. 
Jesus said that He's the good shepherd and His sheep know His voice. You know what that means? That literally means, and I've heard, I, I'm not a shepherd. I'm, I'm an under-shepherd, but I've never had physical sheep shepherding training. I saw a guy from uh, Chile one time shepherding someplace up in Wyoming, and we saw him and spent some time talking to him. But did you know that you could bring sheep from different herds together? This is what, I, what I've heard and what I've read. That you could bring sheep from different herds and flocks. I, I guess sheep are more than herds. And you bring them all together. And the sheep can hang out together and, and spend time together and mingle together. But when it's time to separate and head back to the house, that a shepherd with his voice, with his certain call can call and his sheep will separate out and follow him. It's not a problem. You don't have to have tags so, you know, like cattle saying that well, this is my sheep and my sheep. You just call and the shepherd, when the shepherd calls, the sheep know his voice and they'll follow. And then this shepherd calls and goes, hey, the question is who do you belong to and whose, whose voice are you responding to? We need to follow our shepherd. Look at verse number 4. It says, enter. Where are you going to enter? Into his gates. And how are you going to enter? With thanksgiving. Now I like that. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Now obviously this is talking about back in the day when they would have a, a tabernacle and a temple and, and all that talking about coming into his gates and courts. But listen, we still need to come before the presence of the Lord. There was a time when you there would be people on the outer side. Then you could come to the court. And then you could come within the gates and you'd enter into the holy place. Then there was the most holy place place that only the high priest got entered into. Listen, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that veil that separated everybody from the most holy place was rent from top to bottom, from heaven to earth. Hey, God did that. And there's one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And so we ought to be able to come before his presence. Hey, we come into those gates. We come into the courts. We get close to God. And we do it with thanksgiving and with praise. We do it with thanksgiving and praise. Hey, I don't know how many people are just thankful to have have a church family to spend time with. I was writing back and forth. A fella in New Zealand, a young man in New Zealand, uh, found us on YouTube or something, and he uh, wrote. He's like, Pastor Grice, would you please pray because uh, we've got a a situation, and me and my mom were here. We got saved, and we were watching some of your videos and some other preachers' videos, and we realized we weren't saved, and so we got saved, and we don't ever go to the Catholic Church anymore, and we can't go back, and and we're, we're saved by grace, and we know God saved us, and we just can't go back there. So I found some hymns online, and. So we just go online and we listen to some hymns. And every week we listen to you or somebody else preach or you and somebody else preach. And that's our church service with me and my mom. Would you please pray that God would send a missionary? And I was like, yeah, I'll pray. But man, stink New Zealand. I don't know anybody going to New Zealand. I even looked for somebody going to New Zealand. Couldn't find anybody going to New Zealand. I was like, everybody in New Zealand needs to get YouTube or they're all going to hell. Lots of faith, preacher. But I prayed, Lord, would you please send a missionary. Every couple of months, this kid would write, and thank you for continuing to pray. We're still praying. Me and Mama, we're still faithful. We're li Every Sunday, we'll, we even sometimes during the week, we'll put on and, and we'll listen to songs and we'll listen and we, we're singing. And he goes, it, it's just so good. Thank you for putting stuff up on YouTube. And thank I'm thankful for these other preachers putting stuff up. And man, we just enjoy it. He kept going. All of a sudden, he answered a prayer. He said, Pastor, there's a, a missionary, and he's only like 67 miles away. And he's starting a church, and we're, we heard about it, and we're going to help him. 67 miles each direction. But him and his mama, I almost felt like they quit our church. <laughs> But he still listens. And, uh, and they, they took off and they drive 67 miles to get to church. Do you realize we can't even get people to walk across the street to come to church? And he was thankful to be part. He, he's writing some guy in America because somebody came and went to New Zealand 67 miles away. That'd be like us being thankful for somebody starting a church in Bowie or in Waco and just being excited because a church so close. And they wake up early in the morning and they head out there. He just wrote me this week. And I realized I hadn't heard from him in two years. And he said, thank you. I've noticed y'all been putting a lot more stuff on YouTube again. And man, we sure appreciate that. He goes, he goes I'm a deacon and a Sunday school teacher. Amen. 
That's exciting, guys. In New Zealand. That's not up the road. He drives 67 miles to serve the Lord. So I wrote him back. I was like, brother, that's crazy. That's how exciting. God is so good. And so as we continued to, to talk back and forth, I realized that how, how long it had been because we had just gotten our baby. And we were talking about the MRIs. And, and, and he was like, how's the baby doing? I was like, you didn't know. He's been praying all this time. And, I, and he was one of the people I forgot to let know. He was praying about the lesions and the cerebral palsy. And, and our baby was going to be in the wheelchair. And our baby wasn't going to be able to do anything. I was like, are you kidding? He's climbing all over everything. He's, he's a picture of health. No lesions. No brain damage. No effects from the birth mother's drugs. Amen. Got to rejoice all over again. Hey. Sometimes it's just good to just stop and rejoice and praise the Lord. What a great blessing to have an opportunity to serve the Lord. Hey, 67 miles away, serving, taking a leadership position, doing what God wants him to do. What a hallelujah moment. Hey, friend, some of us were just cranky because we had to get up and thought it might rain on us this morning. Hey, it, it, was, it, was, it was 10 degrees colder this, today than it was last week. So some of us got in a cranky mood. Some of us had to dig out a sweater and come to church and drive 10 minutes. And it put us in a funky mood. Sometimes we just need to check up on our attitude. We need to, we need to make sure that we're entering into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. What a great blessing. Look at verse. Oh, it says right here in, in the same verse. Verse number four. Look at the last half. Be thankful. Be thankful. That's a command. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. Bless His name. You know, there's a lot of people that curse His name. A bunch of people that misuse His name. A lot of people that don't show reverence to His name. We're commanded to bless His name. What a hallelujah to thank. Bless the name of Jesus. Bless God's holy name. What a, what a hallelujah. That's a command, by the way. I know a lot of people go, well, that just seems weird. I don't want to seem all charismatic. You go, bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord! You go, I don't want somebody to think I'm Baptocostal. <laughs> nah, sit around like a lost person. I'm sure that'll be fine with God. Do you realize lifting your whole lifting hands is uh, in the Bible? Amen. Now I know that makes a bunch of Baptist people nervous. But let me tell you something. The Pentecostal folks don't own the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Hey, there ain't nothing wrong. Hey, right in the middle, every once in a while, right in the middle of a song. Hey, I don't even think about it. I don't even realize it until my head's coming back down. But then we'll be singing something. I'm like, who? Praise the Lord. Oh, somebody, you lift your hand, preacher. Somebody's just going to think you're Pentecostal. Sometimes I just wish God's people would get more excited about God than a stupid football game. About the new season of some stupid show. Full of a bunch of wicked people that are going to take turns voting each other out. Off the show. Sometimes God's people ought to just get excited. And you know what? I'm more excited than a Pentecost. You go, no, they run and shout and do everything. They're doing all that and they don't even have eternal salvation. Right. They don't even believe you, you're gonna, you can stay saved. They don't even have eternal security. They believe you can lose your salvation and they're still hooping and hollering. What in the world is wrong with a bunch of Baptists? Why is it that we can't come before His presence with praise and thanksgiving? Why is it that we don't bless His holy name? Why are we not thankful like we're supposed to be? We just, well, I believe in the King James Bible. Why don't you read it, honey, and you'd realize it's okay to shout amen. Hey, it's okay to lift your hands unto the Lord. Hey, it's okay to sing and praise and bless. 
Hey, it ain't enough just to have it sitting in your car. You're going to have to read it and commit it to heart. Hey, you're going to have to read it and put it into practice. It's not enough to say that you love it. Hey, live it. We ought to get excited. We ought to get excited. Look at verse number 5. <laughs> verse number 5 tells us why we need to do all the other things. Why, why is God bossing us around? Why, why would the psalmist boss us around and give us seven things to do? Because of verse number 5. For the Lord is good. When was the last time you just, you say, well, I don't like my job and I don't like my husband and he doesn't like his wife and I don't understand. Our kids are terrible and we have money problems. God's still good. Just because you picked a loser husband doesn't mean that God's not good. It just means you're not a good picker. Just because your wife don't love you just means you didn't study that situation out like you should have. God's still good. Just because you don't know, understand how to handle your finances and handle up on your business or you're not willing to work an extra job and you don't understand basic math that you need to bring in more than you spend out. Hey, God's still good. Just because you're not a mathematician. Just because you're lazy. Just because you, you can't check your attitude and you get fired from every job that you get. Having a bad testimony at every job you've ever worked at. That doesn't... Hey, just because you're a sorry employee doesn't mean that God's not good. Yeah, I said it. God's good even when His people aren't. God is good. That's what, hey, you know what would change your life? Is if you'd spend time doing these seven things and realize the reason why. If we would do all these seven things and, and we realize that we do it, God is good. Listen, God's good all the time, every time. All the time, every time, God is good. You say, well, what about when so-and-so died? God's still good. You say, well, 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 this happened to me and I had to go through this and endure this. Hey, let me tell you something. You be an overcomer and use that testimony to help somebody else through this similar situation. And you'll realize just how good God is. Amen. His mercy is everlasting. I believed in once saved, always saved. Now listen, you've got to get saved before you claim it. But I believe that the blood of Jesus Christ could overcome all the sins of the world throughout all eternity. Do you realize that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the people that didn't even accept Him? And they're going to die and go to hell even though their account was paid? Because they refuse Jesus Christ. If everybody on planet earth just realized, I'm lost, undone, bound for devil's hell, I trust in Jesus Christ. Do you realize that, that the whole world would be saved? The whole world would be saved. And they'd be saved forever. And you say, well, I just think I need to get a new... I, had, I got a letter from jail this week. <laughs> I should stop telling you all the stuff we get to hear from, but I got a letter from a guy in jail, and he, and he wrote me, and, and he said that, he goes, can you please bring me a Bible? All I have is this King James Bible, and I, I can't read it. <laughs> He's got everything he needs. And when I go and see him, that's what I'm going to lovingly tell him. See, it's not a matter you can't read it. He just won't read it. And that's why he's in jail, because he's already he, he's trying to do things his own way. See, you go, yeah, but that's old English. It's not old English. It's early modern English. It's not even middle English. You go, no, it's old English. I know, I read it. No. It's the same as Shakespeare. By the way, when you went to high school, you didn't go, um, miss, miss. I can't read this the way we need to translate it. No, you just read it. And a bunch of your classmates memorized it and did some stupid play about it. And nobody complained when it was Shakespeare. Same time period. Exactly the same time. Knew each other. King James, Shakespeare. Knew each other. And you realize that the same Bible 
translated in 1611 is still 400 years later just as good, just as perfect, just as powerful. <clears throat> It's third grade reading level. Well, maybe it may have gone up to fifth grade now, but for a long time it was third grade. But due to the dumbing down of America, I think now it's fifth grade. Fifth grade reading level. I can't read it. You just won't read it. You say, I need something easier to read. No, Satan needs you to read something easier. Because if he can get you to read something easier, you know what will happen? You'll be reading things and it'll take away the doctrines that are so vitally important. It'll take away the virgin birth. Hey, it'll take away the, the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. It'll take away the deity of Jesus Christ. It'll confuse you as to who Jesus and Satan are together. Uh, you go over and read, you go, are you serious? I can back it all up, substantiate every bit of it. In fact, we did a whole series called King James Moments on YouTube. They'd really help you out if you'd go read it. I mean, go watch them. Or we have pamphlets here that, that you can read and, and know, uh, know and understand. There is a reason that people want an easier easier. And by the way, they always say well, all they do is take out the these and the thous. No, they're not. They're liars. They're liars. They change doctrine. They change words. They change things. And they don't make it all easy. You go, no, they just get rid of the archaic words. In some cases, they add more archaic words. Archaic words. Do you own a dictionary? Yeah, come on. By the way, sometimes it help you go, oh yeah, I have a Hebrew, I have a Greek lexicon in the Hebrew. Hebrew? The only Hebrew I know owns a little deli over in Dallas. And uh, that's the only Hebrew I know. But listen, I know I know a couple of lawyers too. But anyway, listen, our goal, we have an English Bible. You, usually, if you'll just continue reading, the context will define a word that you may not know today. And then if you still can't get it, just open your dictionary up. Webster's real smart most of the time. And just read in your dictionary. And you'll see the word and you'll see what fits. And you go, well, you ought not have to have a dictionary. My kids learning to read have words that they don't understand what they are. And we just go, look it up. What's the context, son? What's the context of the, of the word? And they start reading and go, oh, is it this? That's exactly right. Same way in the Bible. See, we start having little side arguments. You know what we need to do? We just need to let God be God. Because He's God whether we want Him to be or not. We might as well just recognize that He's God. We just need to let the Bible be the truth because it's the truth whether we recognize it or not. I know you've seen the bumper sticker, God wrote it, I believe it, so that settles it. No, no, no. You can delete the whole middle sentence. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. God wrote it and that settles it. So we just need to get to the place where we are accepting that God's Word is truth. This is truth. This is all you need. You need this and faith. And this will help you through every problem that you have in your life. Now God gives us, but He blesses us beyond that. He also gives us fellowship one with another. Hey, iron sharpeneth iron. And we ought, to, we ought to lovingly spend time with one another and, and, uh, and, and fellowship in His Word. His truth endureth to all generations. His Word is truth. Listen, His Word does not change. You go, no, they changed it. I got a new king. That's not His Word. It may have some of His Word, not His Word. By the way, it doesn't need to change. It just needs to be read. It needs to be believed. God gives us some things that we're supposed to do. Make a joyful noise. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. Enter to His gates with thanksgiving. Into His courts with praise. Be thankful to Him. Bless His name. And the reason why, there's three. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And His truth endureth to all generations. You know what your kids are going to need? This book. His truth. You know what your grandkids? Hey, if Jesus tarries, is coming. Your great, great, great grandchildren. You know what they'll need? This book. Because His truth endureth to all generations. All generations. You say, well, this generation's lost and going to hell. Hey, that's because there's not enough people telling them about Jesus. This generation is, is worldly and wayward. 
I'll tell you why. Because too many people are trying to comfort everybody and have a church that, that, that is so comfortable to the world because it is of the world. It's made up by people of the world. It's got the music of the world. It's got the sights and sounds of the world. It has the dress standards of the world. It's got the Bible standards of the world. And all they want to do is change and modernize. And they wonder why, why there is no, there's no conviction. There's no salvation. There's just a bunch of people who want to belong. They sign up for a club. And pretty soon they're off living just as wickedly as they ever have before. And all they do is they take people from small churches who instead of being discipled properly, they snatch young believers from churches all around the country and they bring them into these big mega churches. And then when the mega churches, when the preacher rips everybody off and leaves, and then all of a sudden they scatter, but they never go back. Why? Because their flesh has been fed. And all their flesh hungers for is still those things of the world. Worldly things appeal to the flesh. That's why they put up some buildings and call them churches. And they do nothing but appeal to the flesh. Guys, we have to be stronger than that. We have to be smarter than that. We have to be more spiritual than that. We have to be more godly than that. We have to be more grounded in the word than that. We have to be more established and strengthened in the word than that. We have to be more sober, more vigilant. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You go, wait, I thought you said I'd be saved. Yes, but if he can devour you and get you off track, you'll never win anybody else to the Lord. You'll never win anybody else. If he can distract you and deter you and hurt you, you'll never tell anybody about Jesus. Or if you do, you'll look so stinking worldly, nobody will want what you have anyway. You'll be ineffective. Satan, all he needs to do is get you distracted, discouraged. And if he can do that, he can keep you from winning other people to the Lord. But if you'll stay in the book, and you'll stay faithful, and you'll do what God wants you to do, there's nothing Satan can do about it. And you can be free to tell everybody that you come in contact with that there is a Savior that loves us, that we are all together lost in our, in our, in our condition. That we're definitely on our way to hell. And unless we get forgiveness of sin, we are on our way to hell. But Jesus died on the cross to pay for that sin. And if we put our faith and trust in Him, if we trust in Him, you go, well, I'm trying to be a good person. Maybe, maybe if, I, if I count every sin I've ever done and try to repent of all them, if you could get all your sins right... Jesus was a fool for going to the cross. If you could get yourself right, why would Satan have gone? Why would, why would Jesus have gone to the cross? Jesus would have never had to go to the cross. That's a lie from Satan that you can be good enough. So, well, I would go to church and get saved, but I just want to get things right first. I had a friend that was like that. I had a buddy that was like that. He said, oh, man, I can't come to church. I want to get things right. I need to get this in order. I need to get my house in order. I go, how are you ever going to get them in order? You're a lost man. You're on your way to hell. You don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. How are you going to get things right? How are you going to stop sinning? How are you going to go overcome anything? You have to have Jesus Christ in you. Then he that is in you is greater than he is in the world. Right now, you're just in the world. Satan's got you, buddy. And I just kept pleading with him and pleading with him. One night, I was on the telephone. My wife comes in and says, hey, your buddy's on the phone. I said, can I call him back? And she goes, I don't think so. Take it. I was like, hey, I got to go. Click and went to another telephone. And there he was in tears on the telephone. He said, hey, man, you're right. I just need to get saved. I didn't have to spend a lot of time with him. I'd already gone over the gospel with him probably 15 times. He knew he was lost. He knew he was going to hell. He knew he couldn't overcome. And that night over the telephone, he prayed and asked God to save his soul. He asked forgiveness. Man, I tell you what, hey, he, he still struggles. But he knows he's on his way to heaven. He, know there, hey, he knows that Jesus Christ died for his sins. And although he struggles, he realizes 
that God's for him, that he knows he's a child. And, and he, he feels great shame. And man, he tries to repent, you know, he tries to repent of everything that he's doing, and, and he, he wants to please the Lord. He struggles. But even the Apostle Paul struggled. Hey, some people that say they don't ever struggle. I wonder if they're doing more than just lying. I wonder what they're up to besides just lying. We all struggle. We all make mistakes. We all get mad when we shouldn't get mad. We all have an attitude when we shouldn't have an attitude. Hey, we all have thoughts that come. Hey, you can't stop a bad thought from entering your head any more than you can stop a bird from flying through the sky. But you don't have to let it stop and make a nest in your hair. Just let it come in, and once it's in, just usher it on out. Think about something else. You, how, how do you do that? Start singing. As soon as a bad thought comes in your head, you just say, Lord, I'm coming before you right now. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord. To get rid of these stupid bad thoughts. You can make up, you can make up your own words. Let's all stand. You know what we need to do today? We need to bless His name. We need to bless His name. We need to thank God for His goodness, for His grace, for His truth, for His love, for His patience, for His mercy. We need to be thankful that He is the God and not just a God. I always think about people that worship a God. Do they ever compare their gods with other gods and have like little god fights? Little G God fights? War of the little G gods? We serve the God. The capital G Almighty Creator of everything. Our Shepherd. Our Heavenly Father. Capital G God.